It was not until 1935 that any business for Douglas McFadden came up. I had a letter from him then from an address in Ayr. He said that his brother-in-law, Arthur Paget, had been killed in a motor car accident in Malaya, and so he wanted to redraft his will to make a trust in favour of his sister Jean and her children. She had two children, Donald, born in 1918, and Jean, born in 1921. He asked me if I would undertake to be the sole trustee of his estate and the executor of his will. We were tidying up the loose ends of what was, after all, a fairly simple will. When I asked him what should happen if both he and his sister were to die before the boy Donald was twenty-one, and I suggested that the trust should terminate and the boy should inherit the estate absolutely when he reached his majority, he agreed to this, and I made another note on my pad. Supposing then, I said, that Donald should die before his mother, or if Donald and his mother should die in some way before you, the estate would then pass to the girl Jean. Again, I take it that the trust would terminate when she reached her majority. You mean, he asked, when she became twenty-one? I nodded. Yes, that is what we decided in the case of her brother. He shook his head. I think that would be most imprudent, Mr. Strahan, if I may say so. A lassie of that age is at the mercy of her sex, Mr. Strahan, at the mercy of her sex. I would want the trust to continue for much longer than that, till she was forty at the very least. I stated my own view that twenty-five would be a reasonable age, and very reluctantly he receded to thirty-five. I went back to London to draft out the will which I sent to him for signature. I never saw my client again. One afternoon in January 1948, I got a telegram from Ayr. It read, Regret Mr. Douglas McFadden passed away last night. Please instruct re-funeral. Doyle, Balmoral Hotel, Ayr. In the absence of any traceable relatives, I made the arrangements. In fact, we found Douglas McFadden's heir without much difficulty. We got a letter from a Miss Agatha Paget, who was the headmistress of a girls' school in Corwin Bay. She was a sister of the Arthur Paget, who had been killed in the motor accident in Malaya. She confirmed that his wife, Jean, had died in Southampton in the year 1942, and she added the fresh information that the son, Donald, was also dead. He had been a prisoner of war in Malaya, and had died in captivity. Her niece, Jean, however, was alive and in the London district. The headmistress did not know her home address because she lived in rooms, and she would changed them once or twice. So she usually wrote to her, addressing her letters to her firm. She was employed in the office of Pack and Levy Limited, a company that made shoes and handbags, and whose address was the Hyde. Perivale, London, N.W. I wrote to her. Dear Madam, it is with regret that we have to inform you of the death of Mr. Douglas McFadden at Ayr on January the 21st. As executors to his will, we have experienced some difficulty in tracing the beneficiaries. But if you are the daughter of Jean and Arthur Paget, may we ask you to telephone for an appointment to call upon us at your convenience to discuss the matter further. I am yours truly, N. H. Strawn. She was shown into my office punctually at 10.30 on the following Saturday. She was a girl or woman of a medium height, dark-haired. She was good-looking in a quiet way. She had a tranquility about her that I find it difficult to describe, except by saying that it was the grace that you see frequently in women of a Scottish descent. Well, Miss Paget, I said, I take it that you are the daughter of Arthur and Jean Paget, who lived in Southampton and Malaya. She nodded. That's right. I've got the birth certificate and mother's birth certificate, as well as her marriage certificate. 
She took them from her bag and put them on my desk with her identity card. I opened these documents and read them through carefully. There was no doubt about it. She was the person I was looking for. I leaned back in my chair presently and took off my spectacles. Tell me about your brother Donald, Miss Padgett, I asked. Is he still alive? She shook her head. He died in 1943 while he was a prisoner. He was taken by the Japs in Singapore when we surrendered, and then he was sent to the railway. I was puzzled. The railway? She looked at me coolly, and I thought I saw tolerance for the ignorance of those who stayed in England in her glance. The railway that the Japs built with Asiatic and prisoner of war labor between Siam and Burma. One man died for every sleeper that was laid, and it was about 200 miles long. Donald was one of them. There was a little pause. I am so sorry, I said at last. I took up the will and explained it to her. She hesitated, and then she said, Mr. Strawn, I'm afraid I'm terribly stupid. Do you mean that I inherit everything that Uncle Douglas left? Broadly speaking, yes, I replied. You'd only receive the income from the estate until the year 1956. After that, the capital would be yours to do what you like with. How much did he leave? I picked up a slip of paper from the documents before me and ran my eyes down the figure for a final check. After paying death duties and legacies, I said carefully, the residuary estate would be worth about 53,000 pounds at present-day prices. I must make it clear that that is at present-day prices, Miss Padgett. You must not assume that you would inherit that sum in 1956. A falling stock market affects even trustee securities. She stared at me. Fifty-three thousand pounds. I nodded. That would seem to be about the figure. How much a year would that amount of capital yield, Mr. Strawn? I glanced at the figures on the slip before me. Invested in trustee stocks, as at present, about fifteen hundred and fifty pounds a year gross income. The income tax has to be deducted. You would have about 900 a year to spend, Miss Padgett. Oh. There was a long silence. She sat staring at the desk in front of her. Then she looked up at me and smiled. It takes a bit of getting used to, she remarked. I mean, I've always worked for my living, Mr. Strawn. I've never thought that I'd do anything else, unless I married, and that's only a different sort of work. But this means that I need never work again, unless I want to. She had hit the nail on the head with the last sentence. That's exactly it, I replied, unless you want to. Well, I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have to go to the office, she said. I haven't got any other life. Then I should go on going to the office, I observed. She laughed. I suppose that's the only thing to do. Where do you live, Miss Padgett? She said, I've got a bed sitting room at number 43 Campion Road, just off Ealing Common. It's quite convenient, but of course I have a lot of my meals out. There's a lion's just round the corner. I made a note of her address upon my pad. Well, Miss Padgett, I said, I should go on just as usual for the time being. She looked up at me. Tell me about this trust, she asked. I'm afraid I'm not very good at legal matters. I nodded. No, of course not. Well, you'll find it all in legal language in a copy of the will which I shall give you. But what it means is this, Miss Padgett. You'll see in the will that the testator gave certain powers to the trustees, myself and my partner, to realize capital for the benefit of the legatee in cases where they were satisfied that it would be genuinely for advantage. You mean if I really needed a lot of money for an operation or something, you could let me have it if you proved? She was quick, that girl. I think that's a very good example. In case of illness, if the income were insufficient, I should certainly realize some of your capital for your benefit. She smiled at me and said, It's rather like being a ward in Chancery or something. I know there are all sorts of things I want to ask about, but I can't think of them now. It's all so sudden. 
I turned to my engagement diary. Well, suppose we meet again in the middle of next week. I stared at the pages. Oh, of course, you're working. What time do you get off from your office, Miss Paget? She said, five o'clock. Would six o'clock on Wednesday evening suit you, then? She said, well, that's all right for me, Mr. Strong, but isn't it a bit late for you? Don't you want to get home? No. Uh, perhaps you might like to come to my club and have dinner in the ladies' annex, I said. I'm afraid it's not a very exciting place, but the food is good. She smiled and said warmly, I'd love to do that, Mr. Strong. It's very kind of you to ask me. Jean Paget arrived punctually at the club on Wednesday evening. I took her downstairs to dine. When the ordering was done, I said, Tell me what happened to you in the war. You were out in Malaya, weren't you? She nodded. I had a job in an office with the Kuala Parak Plantation Company. That was the company my father worked for, you know. Donald was with them, too. What happened to you in the war? I asked. Were you a prisoner? A sort of prisoner, she said. After dinner, we sat down to coffee before the fire. I had mentioned one or two things, but she seemed to be thinking about other matters. Over the coffee, it came out, and she said, I've made up my mind what I want to do, first of all, Mr. Strawn. Oh, I asked, what's that? She hesitated. I know you're going to think this very odd. You may think it very foolish of me to go spending money in this way, but... Well, it's what I want to do. I think perhaps I'd better tell you about it now before we go out. It was warm and comfortable before the fire. Of course, I replied. I don't suppose it's foolish at all. What is it that you want to do? She said, I want to go back to Malaya, Mr. Strong. To dig a well. I suppose there was a long pause after she said that. She must have felt reproof in my silence, I suppose, because she leant toward me and she said, I know it's a funny thing to want to do. May I tell you about it? I said, of course. Is this something to do with your experiences in the war? She nodded. I want to try and make you understand. Apparently, Jean's father had been living alone in Malaya when he met his death, his wife having brought the children home to Southampton. Her brother had returned to Malaya in 1937 when Jean was 16, and she left for Malaya in the winter of 1939. For over 18 months, she had a marvellous time with parties almost every night. When war came, it hardly registered with her as any real danger, nor with any of her set. Even when the Japanese landed in the north of Malaya, there was little thought of danger in Kuala Lumpur. Three hundred miles of mountain and jungle was itself a barrier against invasion from the north. But then there came a morning when Jean's chief, a Mr. Merriman, called her into the office and told her bluntly that the office was closing down. She was to pack a suitcase and go to the station and take the first train down to Singapore. Five other girls employed in the office got the same orders. The Japanese at that time were reported to be near Ipo, about a hundred miles to the north. Jean went to the bank and drew out all her money, about six hundred straight dollars. She did not go to the station, however. Instead, she went to Batu Tasik to see Mrs. Holland. Mr. Holland was a man of forty, the manager of an open-cast tin mine. He lived in quite a pleasant bungalow beside the mine with his wife Eileen and their three children, Freddy, aged seven, Jane, aged four, and Robin, who was ten months old. They had often invited Jean to come and stay with them, and she had found their company restful. Jean felt she could not leave without seeing the Hollands and offering her help with the children. Eileen Holland was a good mother and a first-rate housewife, but singularly unfitted to travel by herself with three children in the turmoil of evacuation. Jean got to Batu Tasik fairly easily in a native bus. An hour after she arrived, they were roused by a truck stopping at the bungalow. A young officer came hurrying into the house. You've got to leave this place, he said. 
I'll take you in the truck. The Japs are at Curling, or they were when I last heard. They may be further south by now. Curling was only twenty miles away. I'm taking you to Panong. You'll get a boat from there to get you down to Singapore. Kuala means mouth of a river, and Kuala Panong is a small town at the entrance to the Panong River. There's a district commissioner stationed there. By the time the truck reached his office, it was loaded with about forty men, women, and children picked up for forcible evacuation from the surrounding estates. Most of these were English. The party were unloaded onto the veranda of the accounts office, and here they were able to stretch and sort themselves out a little. Jean and Bill Holland walked into the village to buy what they could. They were able to get a feeding bottle for the baby, a little cordine, some salts for dysentery, and two tins of biscuits and three of tinned meat. Jean got herself a few needles and thread, and seeing a large canvas haversack, she bought that too. She carried that haversack for the next three years. Towards sunset, the lighthouse keepers at the river mouth telephoned to the district commissioner. That the osprey was coming into the river. The osprey was the customs launch which ran up and down the coast looking for smugglers from Sumatra across the Malacca Strait. She was a large diesel engine vessel about a hundred and thirty feet long. The DC's face lit up. Here was the solution to his problems. Whatever was the mission of the osprey, she must take his evacuees on board and run them down the coast out of harm's way. Presently, he left his office and walked down to the quay to meet the vessel as she berthed. She came round the bend of the river, and he saw that she was loaded with troops, small, stocky men in grey-green uniforms with rifles and fixed bayonets taller than themselves. With a sick heart, he watched her as she came alongside, realizing that this was the end of all his endeavors. The Japanese came rushing ashore. The soldiers spread out and occupied the place without a shot. They came to the evacuees sitting numbly in the veranda of the accounts office. Immediately, with rifles and bayonets leveled, they were ordered to give up all fountain pens and wrist watches and rings. An officer came presently when night had fallen, and inspected the crowd on the veranda in the light of a hurricane lamp. He walked down the veranda, thrusting his lamp forward at each group. A couple of soldiers hard on his heels, with rifles at the ready and bayonets fixed. Most of the children started crying. The inspection finished, he made a little speech in broken English. Now you are prisoners, he said. You stay here tonight. Tomorrow you go to prisoner camp, perhaps. You do good things. Obedience to orders, you will receive good from Japanese soldiers. You do bad things, you will be shot directly. So do good things always. When officer come, you stand up and bow. Always, that is good thing. Now you sleep. Tomorrow, you have food. The officer walked away, leaving two sentries on guard at each end of the veranda. In the middle of the next morning, an interrogation began. At the end, the captain said, "Men go to prisoner camp today. Women's and childs stay here. The Imperial Japanese Army do not make war on women's and on childs. Men leave in afternoon, so you will now say farewell till this afternoon. Thank you." That afternoon, the men were separated from their families. Bill Holland turned from his fat, motherly wife, his eyes moist. Goodbye, Jean," he said heavily. "Good luck." And then he said, "Stick with them if you can, won't you?" She nodded. "I'll do that. We'll all be in the same camp together." The men were formed up, seven of them, and marched off under guard. The women and children stayed in the accounts office for forty-one days. The second night was similar to the first, except that the doors of the office were open for them, and they were allowed to use the rooms. 
A stone-faced woman, Mrs. Horsfall, asked to see the officer. When Captain Yoniata came, she protested at the conditions and asked for beds and mosquito nets. No nets, no beds, he said. Very sorry for you. Japanese women sleep on mat, on floor. All Japanese sleep on mat. You put away proud thoughts, very bad thing. You sleep on mat like Japanese women. But we're English, she said indignantly. We don't sleep on the floor like animals. His eyes hardened. He motioned to the sentries who gripped her by each arm. Then he hit her four stinging blows upon the face with the flat of his hand. Very bad thoughts, he said, and turned upon his heel and left them. No more was said about beds. The food issued to them was the bare minimum that would support life, and was an unvarying issue of rice and fish soup given to them twice a day. They received no medical attention and no drugs whatsoever. At the end of a week, dysentery attacked them, and the nights were made hideous by screaming children stumbling with their mothers to the latrine. Malaria was always in the background. On the 35th day, Esme Harrison died. Esme was a child of eight, and she had had dysentery for some time. At the end of six weeks, Captain Yoniata faced them after the morning inspection. Many of the adults and most of the children by that time were thin and ill. He said, Ladies, the Imperial Japanese Army has entered Singapore, and all Malaya is free. Tomorrow you start for Kuala Lumpur. From Panong to Kuala Lumpur is 47 miles. It took a minute for his meaning to sink in. Then Mrs. Horsfall said, How are we to travel to Kuala Lumpur? Will there be a truck? Very sorry. No truck. You walk. She said, We can't walk with these children. We must have a truck. These were bad thoughts, and his eyes hardened. You walk, he repeated. Rice came to them soon after dawn, and about eight o'clock Captain Yoniata appeared with four soldiers who were to be their guard upon the journey. There was nothing for it but to start. The women went very slowly, with frequent halts, as a mother and child retired into the bushes by the roadside. There was no question of walking continuously for an hour and then resting. The dysentery sort of that. For those who were not afflicted at the moment, the journey became one of endless, wearisome waits by the roadside in the hot sun, for the sergeant refused to allow the party to move on while any remained behind. Within the limits of their duty, the Japanese soldiers were humane and helpful. Before many hours had passed, each was carrying a child. They stumbled into Aya Penches at about six o'clock that evening, shortly before dark. This place was a melee village which housed labor for a number of rubber plantations in the vicinity. Presently they slept, exhausted, weak, and ill. They were in a barn full of rats which ran over them and round them all night through. In the morning it was found that several of the children had been bitten. The next day the sergeant drove them on. This time the stage was to a place called Asahan, their accommodation was another rubber-curing barn. Half an hour after their arrival, Mrs. Collard died. Captain Yoniata turned up about midday the following day, driving in the district commissioner's car. He stopped, angry to find that they were not upon the road. Mrs. Horsfall faced him. Mrs. Collard died last night. We buried her this morning over there. If you make us walk every day like this, we shall all die. These women aren't fit to march at all, you know that. What woman die of? he inquired. What illness? She had dysentery and malaria, as most of us have. She died of exhaustion after yesterday's march. You'd better come inside and look at Mrs. Frith and Judy Thompson. They couldn't possibly have marched today. <laughs>
He walked into the barn and stood looking at two or three women sitting listless in the semi-darkness. Then he said something to the sergeant and walked back to his car. At the door, he turned to Mrs. Horsfall. Very sad woman die, he said. Perhaps I get a truck in Kuala Lumpur. I will ask. He got into the car and drove away. His words went round the women quickly. He had gone to get a truck for them. There'd be no more marching. Things weren't so bad after all. They would be sent by rail from Kuala Lumpur to Singapore, and there they'd be put into a proper camp with other English women. A prison camp would have a doctor, too, and there was always some kind of hospital for those who were really ill. They became much more cheerful. Captain Yoniata appeared again about an hour before sunset. Again he spoke to the sergeant who saluted. Then he turned to the women. You not go to Kuala Lumpur, he said. You go to Port Swettenham. English destroyed bridges, so railway to Singapore, no good. You go to Port Swettenham now and then ship to Singapore. There was a stunned silence. Then Mrs. Horsfall asked, Is there going to be a truck to take us to Port Swettenham? He said, Very sorry, no truck. Tomorrow you walk to Bakri. He got into his car and went away, and that was the last they ever saw of him. They slept that night in the bungalow that had belonged to the manager of the Bakri tin mine. They marched again next day to a place called Dilit. In the middle of the afternoon, Ben Collard, the younger son of Mrs. Collard, who had died, trod on something while walking barefoot in the grass that bit him with poison fangs and got away. He said afterwards that it looked like a big beetle. Possibly it was a scorpion. Mrs. Horsfall took charge and laid him on the ground and sucked the wound to draw the poison from it. But the foot swelled quickly, and the inflammation travelled up the leg to the knee. It was obviously painful, and he cried a great deal. There was nothing to be done but carry him, and this was no easy matter for the women in their feeble condition, because he was a boy of seven and weighed five stone. Mrs. Horsfall carried him for an hour, and after that the sergeant took him and carried him the rest of the way. By the time they got to Dillet, the ankle was enormous, and the knee was stiff. At Dillet, there was no accommodation for them, and no food. Later, the headman agreed to move the people from one house so that the thirty prisoners had a roof to sleep under on a floor about fifteen feet square. They rested all next day, and then marched to Klung, three or four miles outside Port Swetnam. Little Ben Collard was neither better nor worse. The leg was very much swollen. Presently, an officer arrived to inspect them, marching at the head of a guard of six soldiers. This officer, whom they came to know as Major Nemo, spoke good English. He said, Who are you people? What do you want here? They stared at him. Mrs. Horsfall said, We are prisoners from Panong. We are on our way to the prisoner of war camp in Singapore. Captain Yoniata in Panong sent us here under guard to be put on a ship to Singapore. There are no ships here, he said. You should have stayed in Panong. It was no good arguing, nor had they the energy. We were sent here, she repeated dully. They had no right to send you here, he said angrily. There is no prison camp here. There was a long, awkward silence. Women stared at him in blank despair. Mrs. Horsfall summoned up her flagging energy again. May we see a doctor, she asked. Many of us are very ill, one child especially. One woman died on the way. What did she die of? He asked quickly. Plague? Well, nothing infectious. She died of exhaustion. I will send a doctor to examine you all. You will stay here for tonight, but you cannot stay for long. A Japanese doctor, very young, came to them within an hour. He had them all up one by one, examined them for infectious disease. They stayed in the schoolhouse under guard, day after day. 
On the third day, they sent for the doctor again, for Ben Collard was obviously worse. Reluctantly, the doctor ordered his removal to the hospital in a truck. On the sixth day, they heard that he had died. They stayed in Klang eleven days, not knowing what was to become of them. On the twelfth day, Major Nemo paraded them at half an hour's notice, allocated one corporal to look after them and told them to walk to Port Dixon. That was about the middle of March, 1942. From Klang to Port Dixon is about 50 miles, but by this time they were traveling more slowly than ever. It took them till the end of the month. By the time they reached Port Dixon, their clothes were in deplorable condition. Jean and Mrs. Holland had nothing but the thin cotton frocks they had worn since they were taken. These were now torn and ragged from washing. Jean had gone barefoot from the early stages of the march and intended to go on without shoes. She now took another step toward the costume of the Malay women. She sold a little brooch to an Indian jeweler. Two of the precious dollars she bought a cheap sarong. A sarong is a skirt made of a tube of cloth about three feet in diameter. You get into it and wrap it around your waist like a towel, the surplus material falling into pleats that permit free movement. When you sleep, you undo the roll around your waist, and it lies over you as a loose covering that you cannot roll out of. It is the lightest and coolest of all garments for the tropics, and the most practical being simple to make and wash. At first, the other women strongly disapproved of this descent to native dress. Later, most of them followed her example as their clothes became worn out. There was no haven for them at Port Dixon, and no ship. They were allowed to stay there, living under desultory guard in a copra barn for about ten days. The Japanese commander then decided they were a nuisance and put them on the road to Serumban. He reasoned, apparently, that they were not his prisoners, and so not his responsibility. At Siliao, between Port Dixon and Serumban, tragedy touched the Holland family because Jane died. Mrs. Holland stood it far better than Jean had expected that she would. It's God's will, my dear, she said quietly, and he'll give her daddy strength to bear it when he hears, just as he's giving us all strength to bear our trials now. She stood dry-eyed beside the little grave and helped to make the little wooden cross. But Jean woke that night in the darkness and heard her weeping. Through all this, the baby, Robin, throve. He ate nothing but food that had been recently boiled and so was relatively free from stomach disorders. Jean carried him every day, and with a continual exposure to the sun, she was getting very brown, and the baby she carried on her hip got browner. Serumban lies on the railway, and they had hoped that when they got there, there would be a train down to Singapore. They got to Seremban about the middle of April, but there was no train for them. The railway was running in a limited fashion, but probably not through to Singapore. Before very long, they were put upon the road to Tampin. They stayed at Tampin for some days and got so little food there that they practically starved. At their urgent entreaty, the local commandant sent them down under guard to Malacca, where they hoped to get a ship. But there was no ship at Malacca and the officer in charge there sent them back to Tampin. They plodded back in despair. At Alo Gaja, Judy Thompson died. To stay at Tampin meant more deaths in it, so they suggested it was better for them to continue down to Singapore on foot, and a corporal was detailed to take them on the road to Gemas. In the middle of May, at Aya Kuning, on the way to Gemas, Mrs. Horsfall died. They got to Gemas three days later. Here, as usual in towns, they were put into the schoolhouse. The Japanese town major, a Captain Nisui, came to the next day to inspect them. Prisoner, not go to Singapore, he said. Strict order. You go now to Kwantan. Woman camp in Kwantan. Very good. You will be very glad. Jean did not know where Kwantan was. She asked, where is Kwantan? Is it far away? Kwantan on coast, he said. You go there now. 
behind her, someone said, It's hundreds of miles away. It's on the East Coast. Okay, said Captain Nisui. On East Coast. Can we go there by railway? Jean inquired. Sorry, no railway. You walk ten, fifteen miles each day. You get there soon. You will be very happy. From Gemas to Kuantan is about a hundred and seventy miles. They left next morning with a sergeant and a private as a guard. They went on for a week, marching about ten miles every other day. Then fever broke out among the children. They never really knew what it was, but in the weeks that followed, it spread from child to child. At Bahau, four children died. Harry Collard, Susan Fletcher, Doris Simmons, who was only three, and Freddie Holland. At Aya Kring, Mrs. Holland came to the end of her strength. She had fallen twice on the march, and they had taken turns in helping her along. In the evening, she was still alive, but unconscious. They did what they could, which wasn't very much, but her breathing got weaker and weaker, and about midday she died. They buried her in the Muslim village cemetery that evening. At Aya Kring, they entered the most unhealthy district they had passed through yet, a country full of snakes and crocodiles and infested with mosquitoes. By day it was steamy and hot and breathless. At night, a cold, wet mist came up and chilled them unmercifully. Jean consulted with the sergeant who advised them to press on and get out of this bad country as soon as possible. They marched each day after that, stumbling along in fever, weak and ill. It took them eleven days to get through the swamps to the higher ground past Temelo. Four days later, in the evening, they came to Moran. And there in front of them they saw two trucks and two white men working on them while Japanese guards stood by. They marched quickly toward the trucks, which were both heavily loaded with railway lines and sleepers. They stood pointing in the direction of Guantan. One of them was jacked up on sleepers taken from the load, and both of the white men were underneath it working on the back axle. They were the first white men that the women had seen for five months. They crowded round the trucks. The guard began to talk in staccato Japanese with the truck guards. One of the men, lying on his back under the axle, shifting spanner in hand, glanced at the bare feet and the sarongs within his range of vision and said slowly, Get those women shifted back so we can get some light. Some of the women laughed, and Mrs. Frith said, Don't you go using that language to me, young man. The men rolled out from under the truck and sat staring at the women and children, at the brown skins, the sarongs, the bare feet. Who said that? asked the man with the spanner. Which of you speaks English? He spoke deliberately in a slow drawl, with something of a pause between each word. Jean said, laughing, We're all English. We're prisoners. He got to his feet. He was a fair-haired, powerfully built man, about twenty-seven or twenty-eight years old. There was something about this man that she had never met before. Are you English? she asked. No fear, he said in his deliberate way. We're Aussies. She said, are you in camp here? He shook his head. We come from Quantan, he said. But we're driving trucks all day, fetching this stuff down to the coast. She said, we're going to Kuantan, to the woman's camp there. He stared at her. Oh, that's crook for a start, he said slowly. There isn't any women's camp at Kuantan. Where do you come from? He inquired. We got taken in Panong. We're being marched to Kuantan. Not all the way from Panong. She laughed shortly. <laughs> We've been everywhere. Bought Swettenham, bought Dixon everywhere. Nobody wants us. I reckon that we've walked nearly five hundred miles. There were thirty-two of us when we were taken. Now we're seventeen. The Australian said softly, Oh, my word. Jean said, Will you be staying here tonight? He said, Will you? Oh, we shall stay here, she said. We can't march the children every day. We walk one day and rest the next. We eat what we can get in the village. He said, If you're staying, we're staying too. 
We can fix this bloody axle so it'll never roll again if needs be. He paused in slow thought. You got no medicines, he said. What do you want? We haven't got any salts at all, she said. We want quinine and something for all these skin diseases the children have got. Can you get those here? He said slowly, I'll have a try. The women and children settled into the school building and began the routine chores of washing that occupied the bulk of their spare time. The news that there was no wounds prisoners camp in Guantan was what they had all secretly expected, but it was a disappointment, nonetheless. That night, the Australian came silently to the door of the school and asked for Jean. He had several little packages for her. That's Cornane, he said. I can get more of that if you want it. And this is what the Chinese take for dysentery. Now, it's all written in Chinese, but what he says it means is three of these leaves powdered up in warm water every four hours. That'll be for a grown-up person. Now, if it's any good, keep the label, and maybe you could get some more in a Chinese drug shop. I've got this sandbuck ointment for the skin. There's more of that if you want it. She took it gratefully from him. That's marvellous, she said softly. How much did it all cost? That's all right, he said in his deliberate manner. The nips paid, but they don't know it. She thanked him again. Jean found out that he had been taken somewhere in Johor, had been driving trucks from Kwantan for about two months. Better than being in a camp, he said. She sat down on the top step of the three that led up to the school, and he squatted down before her on the ground. Are you a truck driver in Australia? she asked. No bloody fear, he said. I'm a ringer. She asked, what's a ringer? A stockman, he said. I was born in Queensland, up behind Cloncurry, and my people, they're all Queenslanders. I was working in the Territory over to the west on a station called Wallara. That's about 110 miles southwest of the Springs. She smiled. Where's the Springs, then? Alice, he said. Alice Springs. Right in the middle of Australia, halfway between Darwin and Adelaide. She said, I thought the middle of Australia was all desert. He was concerned at her ignorance. Oh, my word, he said deliberately. Alice is a bonza place. Plenty of water in Alice. People live in there. They leave the sprinkler on all night, watering the lawns. That's right. They leave the sprinkler on all night. What do you do at this place, Wallera, she asked. Do you look after sheep? He shook his head. Don't find sheep round the Alice region, he said. Be too hot for them. Waller is a cattle station. How many cattle have you got? Oh, about 18,000 when I came away, he said. Goes up and down according to the wet, you know. 18,000? How big is it? Waller? Oh, about 2,700. 2,700 acres, she said. That's a big place. He stared at her. Not acres, he said. Square miles. Waller is 2,700 square miles. She was startled. But is all that one place, one farm, I mean? It's one station, he replied. One property. They sat together for over an hour, talking quietly at the entrance of the schoolhouse. Finally, Jean got to her feet. It's been terribly kind of you to get us these things. You don't know what they mean to us. Tell me, what's your name? Joe Harmon, he said. She said, my name is Jean Paget. She put out her hand. Good night, Sergeant, she said. It's been lovely talking to another white person. He took her hand. There was great comfort for her in his masculine handshake. From Moran to Kwantan is 55 miles. The women rested that day at Moran, and next day began the march down the tarmac road. After one stop, the women marched to Burkapur. At Burkapur, they were accommodated in a large atap copper shed beside the road, and just before dusk, the two familiar trucks drew up in the village, driven by Ben Leggett and Joe Harmon. 
As before, they were headed for the coast and loaded high with railway lines and sleepers. Jean and several of the others walked across the road to meet them with the Japanese sergeant. The Japanese guards fell into conversation together. Joe Harmon turned to Jean. We couldn't get loaded at Jaron Tut in time to make it down to Quantan tonight, he said. Ben's got a pig. A pig? They crowded round Ben's truck. The corpse was lying upon the top of the load, a black, long-nosed oriental pig, somewhat mauled and already covered in flies. Harmon said quietly to Jean, We'll have to let the bloody nips eat all they can and carry away a bit, but leave it to me. I'll see there's some for you. That night, the women got about 35 pounds of boiled pig meat, conveyed to them surreptitiously in several installments. Late that evening, Joe Harmon came to Jean. Sorry I couldn't send you over more of that pig, he said. He slew Queensland drawl. I had to let the bloody nips have most of it. She said it's been Splendid, Joe. We've been eating and eating, and there's still lots left for tomorrow. I don't know when we last had such a meal. We can't thank you enough. He said presently, I believe I know where I could get a chicken or two. If I can, I'll drop them off for you when we come up country day after tomorrow. You ladies need feeding up. Jean said, Don't take any risks, please. Don't worry about me, he said. Tell me, she said suddenly, is it very hot in Australia, the part you come from? Hotter than this? Oh, it's hot, he said. Oh, my word, it can be hot when it tries. It waller it can go to 118. That's a hot day, that is. Oh, but it's not like this heat here. It's a kind of dry heat, so you don't sweat like you do here. She nodded. It's like that, is it? What does the country look like, she inquired. It pleased the man to talk about his own place, and she wanted to please him. He'd been so very kind to them. It's red, he said. Red round Alice and where I come from. Red earth, and then the mountains are all red. The country round about the springs is my place. People come up on the Gan from Adelaide and places in the south, and they say Alice is a lousy town. Well, I only went to Adelaide once, and I thought that was lousy. The country around the springs is beautiful to me. On the evening, the women and children reached Pohoi. A little Malay boy came to Jean with a green canvas sack. He said that he'd been sent by a Chinaman in Gumbang. In the sack were five black cockerels, alive, with their feet tied. Poultry is usually transported alive in the East. They decided regretfully that they would have to part with one of the five cockerels to their guards. The gift of a chicken would make the sergeant sweet and involve him in the affair, rendering any serious investigation unlikely. Accordingly, Jean took the sack and went to find the sergeant. She bowed to him and put him in a good temper. Gunso, she said, good Mishi, tonight we buy chicken. She opened the sack and showed him the fowls lying in the bottom. Then she reached down and pulled one out. For you. She smiled at him with all the innocence that she could master. You buy, he asked. She nodded. From Limau, very good Mishi for us all tonight. Where get money? he inquired. For one fleeting moment, Jean toyed with the idea of saying that they had sold some jewellery with a quick, intuitive feeling that it would be better not to mention the Australians. But she put the idea away. She must stick to the story that they had prepared and considered from all angles. Man, prisoner, give us money for chicken, she said. They say we too thin. Now we have good mishi tonight, Japanese and prisoner also. He smiled at her tucked a cockerel under his arm and walked off with it toward the kitchen where his meal was in preparation. That day there was a considerable row in progress in Kwantan. The local commanding officer was a Captain Sugamo. He lived in a house formerly occupied by the district commissioner of Kwantan. 
and the district commissioner had kept a fine little flock of about twenty black leghorn fowls, specially imported from England in 1939. When Captain Sugama woke up that morning, five of his twenty black leghorns were missing, with a green sack that had once held the mail for the district commissioner, and was now used to store grain for the fowls. Captain Sugamo was a very angry man. He called the military police and set them to work. Their suspicion fell at once upon the Australian truck drivers who had a record for petty larceny in that district. But Captain Sugamo ordered a search of the entire town of Kwantan. On the following day, every house was entered by troops working under the directions of the military police to look for signs of the black feathers or the green sack. It yielded no result. Brooding over the insult leveled at his uniform, the captain ordered the barracks of the company of soldiers under his command to be searched. There was no result from that. There remained one further avenue. Three of the trucks driven by Australians were up country on the road to or from Gerantut. Next day, Sugamo dispatched a light truck on the road manned by four men of his military police to search these trucks and to interrogate the drivers and the guards and anyone else who might have knowledge of the matter. Between Pohoi and Blatt, they came upon a crowd of women and children walking down the road loaded with bundles. Ahead of them marched a Japanese sergeant with his rifle over one shoulder and a green sack over the other. The truck stopped with a squeal of brakes. For the next two hours, Jean stuck to her story that the Australian had given her money and she had bought the fowls from Limau. They put her through a sort of third degree there on the road, with an insistent reiteration of questions. When they felt that her attention was wandering, they slapped her face, kicked her shins, or stamped on her bare feet with army boots. She stuck to it with desperate resolution, knowing it was a rotten story, knowing that they disbelieved her, not knowing what else she could say. At the end of that time, a convoy of three trucks came down the road. The driver of the second one, Joe Harmon, was recognized by the sergeant immediately and brought before Jean at the point of a bayonet. The sergeant of the military police said, Is this man? Jean said desperately, I've been telling them about the four dollars you gave me to buy the chickens with, Joe, but they won't believe me. The military policeman said, You steal chickens from the Shoko. Here is bag. The ringer looked at the girl's bleeding face and at her bleeding feet. Leave her alone, you bastards, he said angrily in his slow Queensland drawl. I stole those chickens and I gave them to her. So what? Jean Paget sat staring into the fire, immersed in her sad memories. They crucified him, she said quietly. They took us all down to Kwantan, and they nailed his hands to a tree and beat him to death. They kept us there and made us look on while they did it. The execution took place at midday at a tree that stood beside the recreation ground overlooking the tennis courts. As soon as the maimed, bleeding body hanging by its hands had ceased to twitch, Captain Sugamo stood them in parade before him. You very bad people, he said. No place here for you. I send you to Kota Baru. You walk now. They stumbled off without a word, in desperate hurry to get clear of that place of horror. The same sergeant that had escorted them from Gemas was sent with them, for he also was disgraced, having shared the chickens. Toward the end of August, they were in a village called Kuala Talang, about halfway between Kwantan and Kota Baru. And here the Japanese sergeant fell ill with fever, probably malaria. He grew weaker and weaker, and two days later he died in the night. The death of the sergeant left them in a most unusual position. They were now prisoners without a guard. I don't see why we shouldn't stay here where we are, said Mrs. Frith. We could grow our own food, perhaps. Half the paddy fields we walk by coming in haven't been planted this year. 
All the men must have gone to the war, said Mrs. Warner, working as coolies, taking up that railway line or something like that. The next morning, Jean went to the headman of the village. He bowed to her and led her to his house and called sharply to his wife within the house to bring out coffee. Jean waited till the coffee appeared, making small talk for politeness. She knew the form after six months in different villages. She bowed to him, lifted a glass and sipped and set it down again. Tell me what you want, he said. I want our party to stay here in this village, she said, and go to work in the paddy fields as your women do. He stared at her, astonished. I have never heard of white mems working in the paddy fields, he said. Have you ever heard of white mems marching and dying as we have marched and died? He was silent. We are in your hands, she said. If you say, go upon your way and walk on to some other place, then we must go, and going, we must die. That will then be a matter between you and God. If you allow us to stay and cultivate your fields and live with you in peace and safety, you will get great honor when the English Tuans return to this country after their victory, because they will win this war in the end. These short ones are in power now but they cannot win against the Americans and all the free peoples of the world. One day the English Tuans will come back. They went to work the next day. Working in these fields is not unpleasant when you get accustomed to it. There are worse things to do in a very hot country than to put on a large conical sun hat of plated palm leaves and take off most of your clothes and play about with mud and water, damming and diverting little trickling streams. By the end of the fortnight, the women had settled down to it and quite liked the work, and all the children loved it from the first. No Japanese came near the village in that time. They lived there for three years. Jean Paget took up the poker and began scraping the ash from the bars of the grate. They were so very kind to us, she said. Is that where you want to go back to, I asked. She nodded. I would like to do something for them now that I've got this money. We lived with them for three years and they did everything for us. We'd have all died before the war was ended if they hadn't taken us in and let us stay with them. Now I've got so much, and they so very, very little. Oh, don't forget you haven't got as much as all that, I said. Traveling to Malaya is a very expensive journey. She smiled. I know. What I want to do for them won't cost so very much, not more than fifty pounds, if that. We had to carry water in that village. That's woman's work, and it's a fearful job. Drinking water has to be fetched from the spring nearly a mile away. We used to go for it with gourds, two in each hand with a stick between them, morning and evening, a mile there and a mile back, four miles a day. That's why you want to dig a well? She nodded. It's something I could do for them, for the women, something that would make life easier for them, as they made life easier for us. A well right in the middle of the village, within a couple of hundred yards of every house. It's what they ought to have. Jean left England for Malaya six weeks later. She only stayed one night in Singapore and took the morning plane to Kota Baru. It's a long day in a jeep from Kota Baru to Kuala Talang. It took her fourteen hours to cover the hundred miles, and it was dark when they drove into Kuala Talang. They stopped in front of the headman's house, and she got out of the jeep a little wearily and went to him and put her hands up in the praying gesture and said in Malay, I have come back, lest you should think the white mems have forgotten all about you when their need is past. He said, We have thought and talked about you ever since you went. And then there were people thronging about her. All were happy to see her again. The next evening she sat opposite the headman on the small veranda before his house, as she had sat so many times before when matters that concerned the women were to be discussed. She sipped her coffee. I have come to talk with you, she said, because I want to give 
a thank offering to this place that people may remember when the white women came here and you were kind to them. He said, the wife has been talking of nothing else all day with other women. They say you want to make a well. Jean said, that is true. I want my thank offering to be a well in the middle of the village. He nodded and then said, this is a matter which concerns the village as a whole, and I must consult my brothers. She did not hurry them. She had lived three years in this village, and she knew the slowness of their mental processes, the caution with which all innovations were approached. It took the men two days to make up their mind that the well would be a good thing to have, and that the wrath of God would not descend upon them if they put the work in hand. Jean sent for five sacks of cement from Cote de Beru and settled down to wait for several weeks while the situation developed. The well diggers and cement arrived about the same time, and work commenced. The diggers were a family of an old grey-bearded father, Suleiman, and his two sons, Jacob and Hussein. Old Suleiman, the father, was a mine of information to the village, for he travelled up and down the east coast of Malaya, building and repairing wells, and so visited most villages from time to time. Jean, sitting by the well one afternoon, said to him, You are from Kwantan. From Batu Sawa, said the old man. That is two hours' walk from Kwantan. Our home is there, but we are great travellers. She was silent for a moment, and then said, Do you remember the Japanese officer in charge at Kwantan in the first year of the war? Captain Sugamo. Assuredly, the old man replied. He is a very bad man, and we were glad when he went away. Jean asked, Did he do many evil things in Kwantan? There was one still hideously fresh in her mind, but she could not bring herself to speak of it directly. Suleiman said, Many people were tortured. She nodded. I saw one myself. It had to come out, and it didn't matter what you said to this old man. When we were starving and ill, a soldier who was a prisoner helped us. The Japanese caught him, and they crucified him with nails through his hands, and they beat him to death. I remember that, the old man said. He was in hospital in Kuantan. Jean stared at him. Old man, when was he in hospital? He died. Uh, perhaps there were two. He called down the well to Yakom. The English soldier who was crucified and beaten at Kwantan in the first year of the war. The English men knew him. Tell us, did that man die? Hussein broke in. The one who was beaten was an Australian, not English. He was beaten because he stole chickens. Assuredly, the old man said. It was for stealing the black chickens. But did he live or die? Jacob called up from the bottom of the well. Captain Sugamo had him taken down that night. They pulled the nails out of his hands. He lived. In Kwantan, in the evening of that day in July 1942, a sergeant had come to Captain Sugamo in the district commissioner's house and had reported that the Australian was still alive. Captain Sugamo found this curious and interesting, and as there was still half an hour before his evening rice, he strolled down to the recreation ground to have a look. The body still hung by its hands, facing the tree. But the man undoubtedly was still alive. When Captain Sugamo approached, the eyes opened and looked at him with recognition. It's doubtful if the West can ever fully understand the workings of a Japanese mind. When Captain Sugamo saw that the Australian recognized him from the threshold of death, he bowed reverently to the torn body and he said with complete sincerity, Is there anything I can get for you before you die? The ringer said distinctly, You 
bloody bastard. I'll have one of your black chickens and a bottle of beer. Captain Zagamo stood looking at the wreck of the man nailed to the tree, and his face was completely expressionless. Presently he turned upon his heel and went back to his house. He called for his orderly as he went into the shade and told him to fetch a bottle of beer and a glass, but not to open the bottle. The man protested that there was no beer. Captain Sugamo already knew that. So he sent his orderly to the town to visit all the Chinese eating houses to see if he could find a bottle of beer anywhere in Kwantan. In an hour the man came back. Captain Sugamo was sitting in exactly the same attitude as when he had gone out to find the beer. With considerable apprehension, he informed his officer that there was no beer in all Kwantan. He was dismissed and went away gladly. Death to Captain Sugama was a ritual. There had been an element of holiness in his approach to the Australian, and having offered in the hearing of his men to implement the last wishes of his victim, he was personally dedicated to see that those last wishes were provided. If a bottle of beer had been available, he would have sacrificed one of his remaining black leghorns and sent the cooked meat and the beer down to the dying man on the tree. He might even have carried the trade on himself. By doing so, he would have set an example of chivalry and bushido to the troops under his command. Unfortunately, it was impossible for him to provide the bottle of beer, and since the beer was missing and the soldier's dying wish could not be met in full, there was no point in sacrificing one of the remaining black legorns. He could not carry out his own part in the ritual. He could not show Bushido by granting the man's dying wish. Therefore, the Australian could not be allowed to die, or he himself would be disgraced. He called for his sergeant. When the man came, he ordered him to take a party with a stretcher to the recreation ground. They were to pull the nails out and take the man down from the tree without injuring him any further, and put him face downwards on the stretcher, and take him to the hospital. To Jean, the news that the Australian was still alive came like the opening of a door. She slipped away and went and sat in the shade of a casuarina tree at the head of the beach to consider this incredible fact. She felt as if she had suddenly come out of a dark tunnel that she had walked down for six years. She stayed on in Kuala Telang until the well and wash house were completed. They had an opening ceremony when Jean washed her own sarong and all the women crowded into the wash house laughing and all the men stood round in a tolerant circle at a distance wondering if they'd been quite wise to allow anything that made the women laugh so much. On the next day, Jean bid farewell once again to her friends and made her way down to Singapore. She wrote to me from there a couple of days later. First she told me what had happened in Kuala Telang. She told me about the well diggers and that Joe Harmon was still alive. And then she went on. I've been puzzling over what I could do to get in touch with him again. And this brings me to what I wanted to tell you when I started this letter. I hope it won't be too much of a shock, Mr. Strahan. I'm going on to Australia from here. Write to me, care of the Bank of New South Wales and Alice Springs, because I know I'm going to feel a long way from home when I get there. It must have been about a week after that that Derek Harris came into my room as a client went out. Derek is one of our two article clerks, and one day I expect to make him a partner, a pleasant, fresh-faced lad. He said, Could you spare a few minutes for a stranger, sir? What sort of a stranger? I inquired. He said, A man called Harmon. He came about an hour ago without any appointment and asked to see you. I understand it's something to do with Miss Paget. It was all beginning to fit in. And yet it was incredible that an Australian stockman should have found his way to my office in Chancery Lane. I nodded. I'll see him. Harris showed him in, and I turned from the window to meet him. He was a fair-haired man, about five feet ten in height. He was thick-set, but not fat, 
I judged him to be between thirty and thirty-five years old. His face was deeply tanned, but his skin was clear. He had very bright blue eyes. He was not a handsome man. His face was too square and positive for that. But it was a simple and good-natured face. He walked toward me with a curious, stiff gait. I shook hands with him. Mr. Harmon, I said, my name is Strawn. Do you wish to see me? And as I spoke, I was unable to resist the temptation to look down at his hand. There was a huge scar on the back of it. I was wondering if you could tell me about Miss Jean Paget, he said, where she lives or anything like that. I smiled. Miss Paget is a client of mine, Mr. Harmon. But tell me, I said, how did you get to know that I was Miss Paget's solicitor? She told me in Malaya when we met that she lived in Southampton, he said. So I went there. I looked in the telephone book and asked a lot of people, but I couldn't find out nothing except she had an aunt that lived in Wales at a place called Colwyn Bay. So then I went to Colwyn Bay. Well, her aunt wouldn't tell me where she lived or anything. All she said was that you were a trustee, whatever that means. So I came here. When Jean Paget stepped down the gangway from the Constellation onto Darwin Airport, she was wildly and unreasonably happy. It is a fact, I think, that till that time she had never really recovered from the war. She had come to England when she was repatriated, and she had done a job efficiently and well with Pack and Levy for two years or so, but she had done it in the manner of a woman of fifty. Deep in the background of her mind remained the tragedy of Kwantan, killing her youth. She was marshaled to the customs office in the hangar. At the foot of the gangway there were three young men who scrutinized her carefully. She found out that they were reporters on the staff of various Australian newspapers, engaged what must surely be the worst assignment in all journalism, meeting every aeroplane that lands on Darwin Airport in the hope of finding a prime minister on board or a woman with two heads. One of them came up to her as soon as she was through the customs. He said, oh, Miss Paget, the stewardess tells me you're getting off here and you're staying at the Darwin Hotel. Can I give you a lift into town? My name's Stuart Hopkinson. I represent the Sydney Monitor up here. She said, that's terribly kind of you, Mr. Hopkinson. I don't want to take you out of your way, though. He said, oh, I'm staying there myself. He had a small Vauxhall parked outside the hangar. He took a suitcase and put it in the back seat and they got in. Would you like to tell me why you're visiting Australia? She laughed. Not very much, Mr. Hopkinson. It's only something personal. It wouldn't make a story. Oh, I was just a thought. I haven't filed a story in a week. Tell me, Mr. Hopkinson, she said, how did the buses go from here to Alice Springs? I want to go down there. I haven't got much money, so I thought I'd go by bus. That's possible, isn't it? Oh, sure, he said. One went this morning. Have to wait till Monday now, though. They don't run over the weekend. But how long does it take? Two days. Start on Monday, stop at Daily Waters Monday night and get in late on Tuesday. It's not too bad a journey, but it can be hot, you know. He put her down at the hotel and carried her bag into the lobby for her. She was lucky in that overcrowded place to get a room to herself, a room with a balcony overlooking the harbour. The next morning, Stuart Hopkinson showed her the way to the bus booking office. He took her into a milk bar and stood her a Coca-Cola. She sucked her straw. I've got to get to Wallera, she said. Yes, that's the name, Wallera. That's near Alice Springs, isn't it? Oh, I don't know, he said. I'll try and find out. He came back to her after lunch with Hal Porter of the Adelaide Herald. Oh, Waller is a good long way from Alice Springs, said Mr. Porter. The homestead must be nearly 120 miles away. You mean Tommy Devine's place? Oh, I think that's it, she said cautiously. Is there a bus there from Alice Springs? There's no bus or any way of getting there except to drive there in a truck or a utility, Hopkinson said. It's on one of Eddie McLean's rounds, isn't it? 
May I mention it? I think it is. Porter turned to Jean. McLean Airways run round most of these stations once a week delivering the mail, he said. You may find you could get there by plane. If so, that's much the easiest. They took her out for a run round Darwin in a car. She exclaimed at the marvellous white sand beaches and the Asia blue of the sea and suggested that a bathing party might be a good thing. Ah, there's one or two objections, Mr. Porter said. One's the sharks. They'll take you if you go out more than knee-deep. Another is the alligators. Ah, then there's the uh, stonefish. He lies in the sand, looks just like a stone till you tread on him, and he squirts about a pint of poison into you. You know, the Portuguese men of wars aren't so good either. But the thing that really puts me off is coral ear. What's that? A sort of growth inside your head that comes from getting this fine coral sand into your ear. Jean came to the conclusion that perhaps she wouldn't bathe in Darwin after all. She asked, is Alice Springs like this? Ah, well, said Hopkinson. Alice is different. Alice is all right. Why is it different? she asked. I don't really know. It's railhead, of course, for trucking cattle down to Adelaide, that's one thing. Ah, oh, but it's a go-ahead place, is Alice. All sorts of things go on there. I wish to God the monitors sent me there instead of here. Jean said goodbye to her two friends that night and started at dawn next morning in the bus for Alice Springs. By the evening they were running through a country that was near to desert. At dusk they stopped for the night at a place called Daily Waters. Daily Waters, she discovered, was a hotel, a post office, a large aerodrome, and nothing else whatsoever. The bus started at dawn next day. Toward evening they found themselves running toward the McDonnell Ranges, lines of bare red hills against the pale blue sky, and at about dusk they ran slowly into Alice Springs and drew up at the Talbot Arms Hotel. Jean went into the hotel and got a room opening onto a balcony, the hotel being a bungalow-type building with a single story, like practically every other building in Alice Springs. Tea was served immediately after they arrived. She changed her dress and strolled out in the town after tea, walking very slowly down the broad suburban roads examining the town. There was a faint suggestion of an English suburb in Alice Springs which made her feel at home. There were the houses, standing each in a small garden, fenced round or bordered by a hedge for privacy. She could now see well what everybody meant by saying Alice was a bonzer place. She found her way back to the main street and strolled up it, looking at the shops. It was quite true. This town had everything a reasonable girl could want, a hairdressing saloon, a good dress shop or two, two picture houses. She turned into the milk bar at about nine o'clock and bought herself an ice cream soda. If this was the outback, she thought, there were a great many worse places. Next morning after breakfast, she went and found the manageress, a Mrs. Driver, in the hotel office. She said... I want to try and get in touch with a second cousin of mine who hasn't written home for ten years. Well, Mrs. Driver was interested. Uh, what's his name? Joe Harmon. Joe Harmon? Worked out at Wallera? That's right, Jean said. Do you know if he's there still? The woman shook her head. I uh, used to come in here a lot just after the war, but he was only here about six months. Old Art Foster, the general handyman, who'd lived in Alice Springs for thirty years, said, Joe Harmon, he went back to Queensland, where he come from. He was at Wallera for about six months after the war, and then he got a job as a station manager at some place up in the Gulf Country. Jean asked, You don't know his address? No, I don't. Tommy Devine would know it out at Wallera. Jean thought about this for a minute, and then said to Mrs. Driver, Is there a telephone at Wallera? I mean, if Mr. Devine knows his address, I'd like to ring him up and get it. Oh, there isn't any telephone, she said. They'll be speaking on the radio schedule morning and evening from Wallera, of course. <laughs>
There was an extensive radio network operated by the flying doctor service from the hospital. Mrs. Devane is sure to be on the air tonight because her sister Amy's in hospital here for a baby, and Edith will want to know if it's come off yet. If you write out a telegram and take it down to Mr. Taylor at the hospital, he'll pass it on to them tonight. Jean went back to her room and wrote out a suitable cable and took it down to the hospital to Mr. Taylor, who agreed to pass it to Wallera. Jean went down to the hospital in the morning and learned that Joe Harmon was the manager of Midhurst Station, near Willstown. She'd never heard of Willstown before. Mr. Taylor obligingly got out a map. What sort of place is it, she asked him. Is it a place like this? He laughed. Oh, it's a fair cow up there. He studied the map. Uh, it's got an airstrip anyway. I suppose it's got much else. Oh, I've never been there. Never heard of anyone who had. Well, I'm going there, she said. I've got to see Joe Harmon after coming all this way. It's likely to be rough living, he said. Oh, my word. Would there be a hotel? Oh, there'll be a hotel. They've got to have their grog. She left the hospital and went thoughtfully to the milk bar. As she ordered her ice cream soda, it occurred to her that it might be a long time before she had another. She spent a quarter of an hour at the post office, sucking the end of a pencil, trying to word a telegram to Joe Harmon to tell him that she was coming to see him. Finally, she wrote, Heard of your recovery from Quantan atrocity quite recently. Perfectly delighted. Stop. I am in Australia now and coming up to Willstown to see you next week. Jean Paget. Jean visited Mr. Sawyer at the bank and arranged for him to transfer to Willstown any credits that might come for her account after she had gone. She left Alice Springs on Monday morning with regret. She flew all that day in a dragonfly, and it was a very instructive day for her. The machine zigzagged to and fro across the wastes of central Australia, depositing small bags of mail at cattle stations and picking up stockmen and travellers to drop them off after a hundred or a hundred and fifty miles. They landed eight or ten times in the course of the day. They got to Cloncurry at dusk, a fairly extensive town on a railway that ran eastwards to the sea at Townsville. She was driven into town in a very old open car and deposited at the post office hotel. She got a bedroom, but tea was over, and she had to go down the wide, dusty main street to a cafe for her evening meal. She had to spend a day here, because the air service to Normanton and Willstown ran weekly on a Wednesday. She went out after breakfast while the air was still cool, and walked up the huge main street for half a mile till she came to the end of the town and she walked down it a quarter of a mile till she came to the other end. Then she went and had a look at the railway station, and having seen the aerodrome, with that she had exhausted the sights of Cloncurry. They got to Willstown about the middle of the afternoon. The town itself consisted of about thirty buildings, very widely scattered on two enormous intersecting streets, or areas of land, for the streets were not paved. The pilot said to Jean as he came down the cabin, Are you getting off here, Miss Paget? Is anyone meeting you? She shook her head. I want to see a man who's living in this district, on one of the stations. I'll have to go to the hotel, I think. Who is it? Al Burns, the shell agent out there on the truck. He knows everyone here. She said, Oh, that's a good idea. I want to see Mr. Joe Harmon. He's manager of Midhurst Station. Joe Harmon? said the man in the truck. He was a lean, dark-haired man of forty or so. Joe Harmon's in England. Went there for a holiday. Jean blinked in utter despair. Went about a month ago, the man said. Jim Lennon works with him out at Midhurst, and he said the other night that Joe will be back about the end of October. The pilot turned to Jean. What'll you do, Miss Paget? You want to stay here now? It's not much of a place, you know. She bit her lip in thought. I'll stay, she said. 
The Australian Hotel was a fair-sized building with about ten small bedrooms opening onto a top-floor veranda. Jean was tired after her day of flying. At nine o'clock, she went to bed. The hotel was lit by electric light made in the backyard by an oil engine and generator set that thumped steadily outside her room till she heard the bar close at ten o'clock. At five past ten, the engine stopped and all the lights went out. Willstown slept. Jean stayed for the next two days in Willstown, sitting on the brander and talking to the ringers, visiting the various establishments in the town. Miss Kenroy took her and showed her the school. Sister Douglas showed her the hospital. Mr. Carter showed her the Shire Hall with the pathetically few books that constituted the public library. Mr. Watkins showed her the bank, which was full of flies, and Sergeant Haynes showed her the police station. By the end of the week, she was beginning to know a good deal about Willstown. Jim Lennon came into town from Midhurst on Saturday. He came in an international utility that Jean learned was the property of Joe Harmon. Mr. Lennon was a lean, bronze, taciturn man. He approached her. I got an airmail letter yesterday, he told Jean with the deliberation of the Queenslander. Joe will be back any time now. Thank heaven, said Jean. I want to see him. I've arranged to fly to Cairns on Wednesday and wait there for him. She gave him her address as the Strand Hotel in Cairns and asked him to let her know when he got accurate news of Joe's arrival. That evening she was sitting in her deck chair on the veranda. A bashful, bearded old man was brought to her. He was carrying a sack. Miss Paget, he said, I'm Jeff Pocock. I've been hunting gators since I was a boy. I reckon I know gators by this time. And Jeff Pocock took the sack, opened it, and took out a small alligator skin rolled up. Of course, he said, I cleaned and trimmed and tanned this one myself. Or well, mostly we just salt them and sell them to the tannery like that. He unrolled the skin before her on the floor of the veranda. Pretty markings, ain't they? I bet you never seen a skin like that in England. The sight of it brought back nostalgic memories to Jean of red buses on the Great West Road at Perivale and Pack and Levy Limited and rows of girls sitting at the workbenches making up alligator skin shoes and alligator skin handbags. She laughed. I've seen hundreds of them in England, she replied. This is the one thing I really know about it. I used to work in a factory that made these skins up into shoes and handbags. She picked up the skin and handled it. Ours were harder than this, I think. You've done the curing very well, Jeff. Two or three other men drifted up. Her story was repeated back and forth, in other words, and she told them all about Pack and Levy Limited. They were very interested. Oh, I know they make shoes of them, said Jeff. I never seen a pair. A vague idea was forming in Jean's mind. How many of these do you get a year? she asked. Oh, I turned in eighty-two last year, the old man said. Of course, that's a little, and I mostly run about thirty to thirty-six inch widths. Uh, that's the width of the skin, that is. That's a gator about oh, eleven feet long. Jean said, Will you sell me this one, Jeff? Why, what do you want it for? She laughed. I want to make myself a pair of shoes out of it. Jean made that pair of shoes, working upon the dressing table of her bedroom. To be more exact, she made three pairs before she got a pair that she could wear. When the Dakota came next Wednesday, she left Willstown for Cairns. She wrote to me from there. She said she desperately needed five thousand pounds to start a shoe factory in Willstown. And then she added, But I'm afraid that's not the whole story. If I'm going to start a workshop for girls, they've got to have something to spend their wages on. I want to start a shop to sell the sort of things that women want. Not a big shop, just a little one. 
I want it to be a sort of ice cream bar with a few chromium-plated chairs and glass-topped tables. I want to sell fruit there and fresh vegetables. If I can't get them any other way, I'll have them flown in from Cairns. I want to do this, Noel. Apart from Joe Harmon and me, they're decent people in Willstown, and they've got so very little. I think I'd want to do this even if there wasn't any Joe Harmon in the background at all. I put her letter to one side for a couple of days, because I never liked to take any action in a hurry. After a period of reflection, I picked up the telephone and rang up Mr. Pack of Pack and Levy Limited, for Jean had said in her letter that she'd also written to him about her plans. I'd like to help her, said Mr. Pack. I must say, when I read her letter, where it says that she's paying seventy shillings for an alligator skin uncured, you could have knocked me down with a feather. Australian shillings, too, that's fifty-six bob of our money. Here have I been paying a hundred and seventy, a hundred and eighty shillings for a cured skin all these years, and thinking I was getting them cheap at that. I said to Mr. Levy, I said, a couple of bloody mugs we are. Well, what can you suggest to help her? I asked. What I thought was this, she said. If she could pay the passage of a forewoman out and home, I'd let her have a girl out of my shop, say for the first year. I got a girl that's getting restless. Well, woman she is, thirty-five as she's a day. She's a married woman, but she isn't living with her husband, hasn't been for a long time. Aggie Top, the name is. You wouldn't get girls playing up in any shop with Aggie Top in charge. Does Miss Paget know her? I inquired. Oh, aye, Jean knows Aggie, and Aggie knows Jean. She'd go out for a year if Jean wants her. They all like Jean. I resolved to make the capital available to Jean, and wrote to her at Cairns. She found my letter waiting for her at the Strand Hotel when she got to Cairns and her spirit soared. I think she was beginning to feel very much alone and amongst strangers while she was waiting in Cairns for Joe Harmon. She knew the name of Harmon's ship, of course, from my letters, and she had no difficulty in finding out when it docked at Brisbane. She went to meet him at the aerodrome in Cairns, feeling absurdly like a girl of seventeen, keeping her first date. I think Joe Harmon was in a position of some difficulty as the Dakota drew near to Cairns. For six years he had carried the image of this girl in his heart. But the girl that he remembered had long black hair done in a pigtail down her back with the end tied up with a bit of string like a Chinese woman. She was a very sunburnt girl, almost as brown as a melee. He did not really think that she would look like that at Cairns, and he was troubled and distressed by the fact that he probably wouldn't be able to recognize her again. But Jean recognized him as he came out of the plane, fair-haired, blue-eyed, and broad-shouldered. She left the rails and walked quickly across the tarmac to him and said, Joe! He stopped and stared at her incredulously. He grinned a little sheepishly and said, Hello, Miss Paget." She took his hand impulsively and said, Oh, Joe. He pressed a hand and looked down into her eyes, and then he said, uh, Tell me, what are you doing in Cairns? A little smile played around her mouth. What were you doing in England? He was silent, not knowing what to say to that. He had no lie ready. They took a taxi to her hotel and ordered cold beers. Joe drank four as they caught up on each other's stories. Let me have a good look at you, Joe. He stood before her, examining her beauty. He had not dreamed when he had met her in Malaya that she was a girl like this. You've not changed, she said. Does the back trouble you? Oh, not much, he said. It doesn't hinder me riding, thank the Lord, but I can't lift heavy weights. She nodded and took one of his hands in hers. He stood beside her while she turned it over in her own and looked at the great scars upon the palm and on the back. What about these, Joe? Oh, they're all right, he said. I can grip anything, start up a truck or anything. How did you get here, he asked. She said, 
I knew you used to work at Wallera. I thought they'd know about you there, so I flew from Singapore to Darwin and went down to Alice on the bus. I got your address at Midhurst from Mrs. Duveen over the radio from the hospital. So then I flew to Willstown. He stared at her. Is that Dinky Dye? You been to Willstown? She nodded. I was there three weeks. Three weeks? He stared at her. But why three weeks? Three hours would have been enough to most people. What do you think of Willstown, Miss Paget? She smiled. Look, Joe, forget about Miss Paget. Call me Jean. If you go on with Miss Paget, I'll go home tomorrow. He smiled slightly. All right, Jean. What do you think of Willstown? She smiled at him with her eyes. I thought it was an awful place, Joe, she said quietly. I want to talk to you about it. We must go and have tea now. He got up from his chair and set the glass down. Too right, he said heavily. It's a crook kind of place for a woman. Their food came, roast beef for Joe, cold ham and salad for Jean. What have you been doing since you came to Cairns? he asked presently. Been out to the reef? She shook her head. He paused and then he said, Would you like to go to Green Island for the weekend? She cocked an eye at him. What's Green Island like? Oh, it's just a coral island on the reef, he explained. A little round one about half a mile across. There's a restaurant on it and little sort of bedroom huts where you can stay in among the trees. Oh, it's a bonza little place if you like bathing and where you bathers all day. I'd like to do that, Joe. They left next morning in a fishing boat, a motor launch with a canopy. There were no other visitors staying on the island, and they got two of the little bedroom huts in among the trees. They bathed at once. As they turned to go into the water, she saw his back for the first time, lined and puckered and distorted with enormous scars. Deep pity for him welled up in her at the sight. This man had been hurt enough for her already. She must not hurt him any more. They slept on their beds in the heat of the day after lunch and bathed again before tea. In the cool of the evening, they went out to the end of the jetty and fished. In the evening light, sitting together on the jetty and watching the sunset over the calm water, she had expected him to make a slight pass and she was disappointed that he didn't do so. She had expected more of him than this, and that she didn't get it was beginning to distress her. She would expected to spend the whole weekend on the defensive in repelling borders, so to speak. But so far things had worked out very differently. Joe Harmon's behavior toward her had been above reproach. He would not tried to kiss her, or even to make opportunities of touching her. It was no better when it was time for bed. She would have liked to have been kissed in the quiet darkness under the palm trees, but Joe didn't do it. They said good night in the most orderly way, not even shaking hands, and they retired to their huts with perfect decorum. She lay awake for a long time, restless and troubled. Things were no better the next day. They bathed in the cool of the morning in that marvellous translucent sea. By tea time they were finding that they had both exhausted their light conversation. The restraint was heavy upon both of them. And there were long, awkward pauses when neither of them seemed to know what to say. In the evening light they decided to walk round the island on the beach. She left him at the door of her hut and said, Give me a couple of minutes, Joe. I don't want to go round the beach in this frog. She pulled one of the curtains for privacy. As she changed, she thought that they had only one more day, and so much to settle that they had not started on. She'd get nowhere without taking a bit of a risk, and it was worth it for Joe. In the half-light he turned as she came out of the hut, and he was back in the Malay scene of six years ago. She was wearing a cotton sarong 
Her brown shoulders and her brown arms were bare. She was barefooted, and her hair hung down in a long plait, tied at the end with a bit of string, as it had been in Malaya when he first saw her. She came to him rather shyly, and put both hands on his shoulders and said, Is this better, Joe? She could never remember very clearly what happened in the next five minutes. She was standing locked in his arms, as he kissed her face and her neck and her shoulders hungrily while his hands fondled her body. In the tumult of feelings that swept over her, she knew that this man wanted her as nobody had ever wanted her before. She stood unresisting in his arms. It never entered her head to struggle or try to get away. The next thing she realized was that they were in her bedroom hut. Standing in his arms, still unresisting, smothered by his kisses, she thought, this is it. And then she thought it had to happen sometime. And I'm glad it's Joe. She detached herself and sat down on the bed. He followed her down. She reached her right arm round his shoulders and said quietly, Dear Joe, if you can wait till we're married, I'd much rather. But whatever you do now, I love you just the same. He looked down into her eyes. Say that again. She drew his head down to her and kissed him. Dear Joe, of course I'm in love with you. What do you think I came to Australia for? Will you marry me? Of course I'll marry you. She looked up at him with fondness and laughter in her eyes. Anyone looking at us now would say we were married already. He grinned. He was holding her more gently now. I don't know what you must think of me. Shall I tell you? She took one of his wounded hands in hers and fondled the great scars. I think you're the man I want to marry and have children by. After breakfast, as they sat smoking cigarettes over a last cup of coffee, he said, I've been thinking. I'm going to give up, Midhurst, as soon as Mrs. Spears can find another manager. Jean listened in consternation. What was coming now? If we could get a grazing farm for fattening in back of Adelaide or Malala or Hamley Bridge or Balaclava or some place like that, it's on the railway down from Alice Springs, not too far from the abattoir. That's what I'd like to do. She sat in silence for a minute. Why do you want to do that, Joe? What's wrong with Midhurst? Ah, it's too far from anywhere, he said. All right for a single man, perhaps, but not for a married couple. But, Joe, she said, is that the sort of work you want to do? Just buying store cattle from the outback and fattening them? It sounds awfully dull to me. Are you fed up with the outback? He ground his cigarette out on the floor beneath his heel. There's places that suit single men and places that suit married people, he said. You've got to make a change or two when you get married. Well, I don't think you ought to leave the outback just because we're getting married, she said. He smiled at her. The Gulf country is no place for a woman, he said. A man hasn't got a right to try and make an English girl live in a crook place like Willstown. She smiled. It isn't only English girls, Joe. Australian girls, girls born in Willstown, they run a thousand miles to get away from it. He grinned. That's right. Well, if they can't stand it, how could you? I don't know that I could, she said thoughtfully. Then she smiled at him. I think we'll have to do something about Willstown. They spent that day in a curious mixture of lovemaking and economic discussion. Joe, she said, listen to me. Would you think it very stupid if I said I wanted to start a business in Willstown? He stared at her. Business? What sort of business could you do in Willstown? Do you know what I was doing in England? She inquired. Oh, shorthand typing, wasn't it? She took his hand and smoothed it between her own... There's such a lot that you don't know about me, she said. So much to tell you. She started in to tell him about Pack and Levy and Mr. Pack and about alligator skin shoes and Aggie Top. 
Half an hour later, she said, That's what I want to do, Joe. Do you think it's crazy? I don't know. And then quite unexpectedly, he said, I took a walk down Bond Street looking in the shops. She turned to him, surprised. Did you, Joe? He nodded. I saw a lot of alligator skin shoes, he said. And the prices, oh, my word. She was excited. Joe, I bet they were made by Pack and Levy. We did all that sort of work. You weren't thinking you could make them in Willstown? Yes, Joe. A little workshop with six or seven girls making alligator skin shoes. It won't cost very much, Joe. Not more than I can afford to lose if it goes wrong. Mr. Strahan may have told you I inherited some money. He nodded. Well, if it worked out all right and if it paid, it'd be a good thing for the town. I've got another shock for you. I want to start an ice cream parlor. Oh, my word. He looked at her, uncertain if she was laughing or not. An ice cream parlor in Willstown, he said. It'll never pay. She turned to him. Joe, did you ever spend a Sunday in Alice Springs? He shook his head. I know why that is, too, she said. The pubs are shut. He grinned. Too right. Well, the pubs shut in Willstown, too, on Sundays. Sunday's the best day of all for the ice cream parlor at Alice. All the men who are in the bar all the week come along with their wives and kids on Sunday to the ice cream parlor and put down ice cream sodas and Coca-Cola. That place does a roaring trade on Sundays. Yeah, it would, he said thoughtfully. There'd be nothing else to do. He bent and kissed her. There's another thing, Joe, she said. I don't know, but I've got a sort of feeling that there's more to it than just employing a few girls. You say the ringers are all leaving the Gulf country, and men won't come to the outback. Well, of course they won't if they can't get a girl. And all the girls go because they can't get a job. Don't you see, Joe, for every girl I make a job for, I believe you'll get a man to work at Midhurst. Well, don't you think that's true? I don't know. He stared out over the sea to the dim blue line of the tableland. It had certainly helped to have a flock of girls round. It can be lonely in the outback. Oh, my word, it can. In the evening, as they kissed goodnight between their bedroom huts, she said, We won't be able to do this in Willstown, not till we're married and respectable. I'll remember this green island all my life, Joe. They left next morning when the motorboat came for them and landed at Cairns early in the afternoon. They spent the rest of the afternoon shopping and ordering and got back to the hotel at dusk, tired out, having booked their passages to Willstown on the morning plane. Jean said, There's one thing I must do tonight, Joe, before leaving Cairns. I must write to Noel Strawn and tell him what's happened. I was touched by her letter, thrilled at her news, and ever so slightly sad at the thought that I would probably never see her again. In the months of November and December that year, Jean Paget worked harder than she had ever worked before. Joe Harmon helped her to get the building started on the day that they arrived in Willstown. They had a meeting with Tim Whelan and his two sons in the carpenter shop among the coffins. They had already placed orders for two lorry loads of lumber in Cairns. The men stood or sat squatting ringer fashion with papers on the floor before them, planning the layout of the buildings. The workshop with its three-bedroomed annex was to be built first, and after that the ice cream parlor next to it, leaving room for the expansion of the workshop one way and of the ice cream parlor the other way. There were no great difficulties of expansion in the built-up area of Woolstown. Jean went to Brisbane a week later. She stayed there for three days and came back having ordered an electric generating set, a very large refrigerator, two deep freezers, a stainless steel counter, eight glass-top tables, thirty-two chairs, two sink units, and a mass of minor shop fittings, glasses, plates, cutlery, and furnishings, as well as a good deal of electrical fittings and cable. She also made tentative arrangements for supplies of stock for the ice cream parlor. When she came back to Willstown a week later, she found the framework of the workshop already erected. A wooden building goes up very quickly.
the matter was a nine days' wonder in Willstown, and old men used to stand round wondering at this midsummer madness of an English girl, a stranger to the Gulf country, who proposed to make shoes there, and send them all the way to England to be sold. They were too kindly to be rude to her, or to laugh at such an eccentricity, but an aura of disbelief surrounded the whole venture, and made her feel very much alone in those first weeks. She visited Midhurst at an early stage, one Sunday when no work was going on upon a building. Joe Harmon drove into Fetcher in his big utility at dawn, and took her back to Midhurst in time for breakfast. As soon as they were out of sight of the town, they stopped for five minutes to kiss and talk. Presently they disentangled and went on. The land was parched and dry with the heat of summer, covered with thin tufts of scorched grass. Once in twenty miles she saw half a dozen cattle that stampeded wildly at the noise of the utility as it bounced and rocketed over the uneven ground. She asked Joe what on earth the cattle found to eat. The ground seemed to her to be completely barren. Ah, they get along, he said. There's plenty here for them to eat, my word. This dry stuff in the tussocks, why, it's just the same as hay. He told her that there was a water hole a little way from the track. They never go more than three or four miles from water, he said. Our horses, now you'll find them grazing up to twenty miles from a drink. Once she exclaimed as three brown, furry forms bounded away among the trees. Oh, Joe, kangaroos! He corrected her. Wallabies, don't get any roos up in these parts. She stared after the flying forms and tranced. Well, what's the difference between a wallaby and a kangaroo, Joe? A wallaby's smaller, he said. A big buck kangaroo, he'll stand up to six feet high, but a wallaby's not more than four. A kangaroo, he's got a face like a deer. A wallaby, he's got a face like a rabbit or a rat. I've got a little wallaby to show you at the homestead. A wild one? Ah, oh, it's time now. He'll get wild as he grows older, then he'll go off to his own folks. I like a wallaby about the place, he said. They came to Midhurst presently, a fence of two wire strands tacked to the trees with an occasional post in the wider gaps crossed their path with an iron gate. Beyond the gate the track became the semblance of a road. She got out of the utility and opened the gate and he drove through. This is the home paddock, he said, for horses mostly. She could see the horses standing underneath the trees, lean riding horses swishing long black tails. I've got about three square miles fenced off like this round the house. The road swung round and she saw Midhurst Homestead. It was prettily situated on a low hill above the bend of the creek. The creek was not running, but there were still pools of water held along its length. The homestead was a fairly large building that stood high off the ground on posts, so that you climbed eight feet up a flight of steps to reach the veranda and the one floor of the house was built of wood and had the inevitable corrugated iron roof. Four rooms, three bedrooms and one sitting room, were surrounded on all four sides by a veranda twelve feet deep. Masses of ferns and greenery of all sorts stood in pots and on stands on this veranda at the outer edge, and killed most of the direct rays of the sun. There was a kitchen annex at one end and a bathroom annex at the other. The toilet was a little hut over a pit in the paddock, some distance from the house. Most of the life of the building was evidently on the veranda. The room seemed to be little used. On the veranda was Joe's bed and his mosquito net and several cane easy chairs and the dining room tables and chairs. Suspended from the rafters was a large canvas water bag cooling in the draft with an enameled mug hanging from it by a string. Five or six dogs greeted them noisily as the utility came to a standstill before the steps. He brushed them aside, but pointed out a large blue and yellow bitch like no dog Jean had ever seen before. That's Lily, he said fondly. She had a bonza letter, oh my word. He took her up into the coolness on the veranda. She turned to him. Oh, Joe, this is nice. You like it? <laughs> 
He looked round. There's the Jowy somewhere. They found the little wallaby lolloping about on the other side of the veranda. It stood like a little kangaroo about eighteen inches high, and had no fear of them. Jean stooped beside it and it nibbled at her fingers. What do you feed it on, Joe? Bread and milk. It's doing fine on that. Well, don't the puppies hurt it? Oh, they chase it now and then, but it can kick all right. A full-grown wallaby can kill a dog, rip him right up. He paused, watching her caress the little creature, thinking how lovely she was. Oh, it's all in fun, he said. They get along all right. By and by, when he gets bigger and the dogs are bigger, he'll get angry with them, and he'll go off into the bush. Joe's housekeeper, a fat middle-aged black woman called Palm Olive, laid the table, and presently appeared with two plates of the inevitable steak with two eggs on the top and a pot of strong tea. Jean had become accustomed to the outback breakfast by this time, but this steak was tougher than most. She made mental notes to look into the Midhurst cooking as she struggled with it. In the end, she gave it up and sat back laughing. I'm sorry, Joe, she said. It's because I'm English, I suppose. He was very much concerned. Oh, well, have a couple more fried eggs. You haven't eaten anything. I've eaten six times as much as I ever ate in England for breakfast. Tell me, Joe, she said, do you ever get indigestion? He grinned. Uh, not very often, just now and then. You wouldn't mind if I reorganize the cooking a bit when I come in? Well, not so long as you don't do it all yourself, he said. You wouldn't like me to do that? He shook his head. I'd rather see you keep time for the things you want to do. The shoes, the ice cream bar and that. She touched his hand. I want to keep time for you. Later in the morning, Jean went to investigate the kitchen. Primitive was the word, she thought. There was a wood-burning hearth and a wick-burning oil stove. This was the cooking equipment. There was a small kerosene refrigerator. Masses of cooked meat were stored in a wire gauze meat safe with nearly as many flies inside it as there were outside. The utensils were old-fashioned and dirty and few in number. It was a nightmare of a kitchen. Jean felt the right course would be to burn it down and start again, and she wondered if this could be done without burning down the house as well. There was little in the store cupboard but staple food, such as flour and salt and soap. She put on a kettle to boil for coffee and looked round for other provisions. Eggs were plentiful at Midhurst, and she found some stale cheese. As they drank their coffee, they talked about the kitchen and the house. It's just the kitchen that needs altering, she said. The rest of it's lovely. I'll get a toilet fixed up in the house before you come, he promised her. It's all right for me going out there, but it's not very nice for you. She laughed. I don't mind that so long as you keep up the supplies of the Saturday evening post. He grinned, but she found him set upon this alteration. Some places have a septic tank and everything, he said. They put one in at Augustus when the Duke and Duchess stayed there. Oh, I reckon we'll have to wait a while for that. He drove her back into Willstown at about nine o'clock that night. They halted for a while outside the town to say good night in proper style. She lay against his shoulder with his arm round her, listening to the noises of the bush, the croaking of the frogs, the sound of crickets, the crying of a night bird. It's a lovely place you live in, Joe, she said. I just want a new kitchen, that's all. Don't ever worry about me not liking it. He kissed her. It'll be all ready for you when you come. April, she said. Early in April, Joe. Jean started up the shoe workshop in the first week of December, three or four days after Aggie Top arrived from England. To start with, she had five girls. The workshop was popular from the first, and Jean never had any difficulty getting as many recruits for it as she could handle. For the early months, however, she was content with five. She spent a hectic fortnight after the workshop opened getting the ice cream parlor furnished and stocked. She was resolved to have this open by Christmas Day, and she achieved her aim by opening on December the 20th. Rose Sawyer, a young girl from Alice Springs, was the manageress. Jean stood with Joe outside in the blazing, sunlit street on that first afternoon, looking. 
at what she'd done. The workshop and the ice cream parlour stood more or less side by side on the main street. The windows of the workshop were closed to keep the cool air in, but they could hear the girls singing as they worked over the shoes. Christmas was near, and they were singing carols. Holy Night, and Good King Wenceslas, and See Amid the Winter Snow. The shirt was sticking to Jean's back, and she shifted her shoulders to get a little air inside. Well, there it all is, she said. Now we've got to see if we can make it pay. Come on, I'll buy you soda, he said. That'll help. They went in and bought a soda from Rose Sawyer behind the counter. This part of it'll pay, he said. I don't know about the shoes, but this should do all right. I was talking to George Connor up at the hotel. He's getting very worried about his bar with you starting up. I don't see that he's got anything to worry about, she said. I'm not going to sell beer. You're going to sell drinks to ringers, he remarked. If you had a bar instead of this, wouldn't it rile you? She laughed. I suppose it would, but I can't see myself putting a bar out of business, Joe. Joe, she said, after pause. I had an awful row this week with a bank manager, Mr. Watkins. Did you hear about it? He grinned. I did hear something, he admitted. What really happened? Well, it was the flies, she said. It was so hot on Friday, and I was so tired. I was sweating, I suppose. I lost my temper, Joe. I oughtn't to have done that. I told him I was closing my account because I couldn't stand his bloody flies. I said I was going to bank in Cairns and get the cash in by Dakota every week. I said I was going to write to his head office in Sydney and tell them why I'd done it. I said I was going to write to the Bank of New South Wales and offer my account to them if they'd start up a branch here with no flies. I said he ought to be setting an example to Willstown instead of... She stopped. Instead of what? Joe asked. She said weakly, I forgot what I did say. I did hear in the bar you told him he ought to set an example instead of sitting on his ass and scratching. Joe, I couldn't have said that, he grinned. That's what they're saying, you told him, in Willstown. Oh, I'll go in on Friday and apologize, she said. It's no good making quarrels in a place like this. I don't see why you should apologize, he objected. It's up to him to apologize to you. After all, you're the customer. He paused. I'd go in there on Friday and see how he's getting on. I know he got ten gallons of DDT spray on Saturday because Al Burns told me. Jean went to the bank on Friday and cashed the wages check as usual. She found that the walls were in the process of being distempered and there was not a fly in the place. Mr. Watkins was distant in his manner and ignored her. Len James, the young bank clerk, gave her her money with a broad grin and a wink. She saw Len again on Saturday afternoon when he brought in Doris Nash for an ice cream soda. He grinned at her and said, You wouldn't know the bank, Miss Paget." On the first Sunday, Jean worked steadily in the ice cream parlour with Rose Sawyer from nine in the morning till ten o'clock at night. They sold a hundred and eighty-two ice creams at a shilling each and three hundred and forty soft drinks at sixpence. She opened again after lunch on Christmas Day and took twenty pounds in the afternoon and evening. She had the gramophone from the workshop in the parlour that evening playing dance music so that the little wooden shack that was her ice cream parlour streamed out light and music into the dark wastes of the main street, and seemed to the inhabitants just like a bit of manly beach dropped down in Willstown. Old withered women that Jean had never seen before came in that night with equally old men to have an ice cream soda drawn by the lights and by the music. The workshop went fairly steadily under Aggie Top, and they dispatched two packing cases of shoes to Forsyth just after Christmas to be sent by rail to Brisbane and by ship to England. She had already sent a few early samples of their work to Pack and Levy by airmail. A couple of weeks later, Rose Sawyer talked to Jean. Tell me, Jean, do you think there'd be any work up here for a contractor? Jean stared at her. 
Oh, what sort of contractor? Billy Wakeling from Alice. Friend of mine. You know, his father's a contractor in Newcastle. He's got graders and bulldozers and steam shovels and all sorts of things like that. Well, said Jean, I know Joe Harmon wants some little dams built up on Midhurst. I don't know if that's in his line. Oh, I should think it might be, said Rose slowly. After all, it's shifting muck, and that's what Billy does. He'd do it with a bulldozer in the dry, wouldn't he? I haven't the least idea, said Jean. Can he get hold of a bulldozer? His old man's got about forty down in Newcastle, Rose said. I should think he could spare one for Billy. Jean asked, Could you scoop out a hole for a swimming pool with a bulldozer? Oh, I should think so, yes, I'm sure you could. Why, do you want a swimming pool? Jean stared at the white-painted wall. It was just an idea. Nice big pool just by the bore, with diving boards and everything. Big enough for everybody to get into and have fun. Have a lawn of grass by it where people could lie and sunbathe if they want to. An old man taking cash at the gates. A bob a bathe. Rose stared at her. You got it all worked out. You thinking of doing that, Jean? I don't know. It would be fun to have it. I believe it'd pay like anything. Oh, mixed bathing, of course. Rose laughed. Have all the warehouses in the place looking over the rails to see what was going on. Charge them sixpence for that, said Jean. I don't believe there's a swimming pool in the whole Gulf country. Would be fun to have one. Jean received an airmail letter from Mr. Pack about the air freight consignment of shoes that he'd received from him. His enthusiasm was temperate. He pointed out a number of defects and crudities which would require correction in production batches. Most of these they were aware of and had attended to. He finished up by saying he'd try and shift them, which, knowing Mr. Pack, Jean and Aggie Top interpreted as praise. Joe Harmon rode into the town that afternoon with Pete Fletcher. He put his horse into the stable behind the Australian hotel and came to find Jean. He was wet and dirty in his riding clothes, because the rainy season had begun in earnest and the creeks were up. And though he had started spick and span from Midhurst, as befits a man going into town to see his girl, he had had to swim one of the two creeks on the way, holding on to the mane and saddle of his horse, which had rather spoilt the sartorial effect. He was half dry when he got to Willstown. He combed his hair and emptied out his boots and went to the ice cream parlour to ask Rose where Jean was. He found her in her bedroom, writing a long letter to me. He tapped on the door and she came out to him. Oh, we can't talk here, Joe. I'll never hear the last of it if you come in. Let's go and have an ice cream in the parlour. And as she said it, it was suddenly borne in on her that this was literally the only place in Willstown where young men and young women could meet reputably to talk. The alternative in the wet would be to go into a stable or the barn. They picked a table by the wall. She looked round her at the rectangular walls and the adjacent tables with discontent. Oh, this won't do at all, she said. I'll have some sort of booths made, little corners where people can talk privately. What'll you have? he asked. I'll have a banana split, she said. Oh, don't pay, Joe. Have it on the house. He grinned. Think I'm the kind of man to take a girl out and let her shout? Oh, if you're feeling like that, I'll have two. The bananas will be going bad by tomorrow. She was getting fruit flown in by the Dakota every Wednesday. She had little difficulty in selling the small quantity she got at prices that would pay for the air freight. Her trouble was that usually she couldn't keep it for a week. Joe came back with the ices and sat down with her. Thanks, she said. Joe, about those little dams you were talking about on Green Island, have you got anyone to build them for you yet? He shook his head. It's no good thinking about those until the dry. Could a bulldozer build them? Oh, my word, he said. If anybody had a bulldozer, he'd build a lot inside a month. But there's no bulldozer this side of the curry. There might be one, she said. She told him about Rose Sawyer and Billy Wakeling. He's coming up to see her anyway, she said. And she says he's looking for that sort of work to do up here.
I suppose he's turning into Rose's steady. You'd better take him out to Midhurst when he comes and have a talk to him. My word, he said. If we had a joker with a bulldozer in Will's stand, it'd make a lot of difference to the stations. It'd make a lot of difference here in Will's town, she observed. Joe, if we had a really decent swimming pool just by the bore, with little cabins to change in and green lawns to sunbathe on and diving boards, and an old man in charge to mow the grass and keep it clean and nice, would people use it, Joe, if we charged, say, a bob a bathe? They discussed the swimming pool for some time and came to the conclusion that it could never pay upon the basis of a town with a hundred and fifty people. It's just a question of how fast this town's going to grow, he said. A swimming pool is just another thing to make it grow. There's not a town in the whole Gulf country that's got a pool. Well, the ice cream parlor's paying definitely, Jean said. If we can keep up the quality, I feel we're home on that one. I'd like to try the swimming pool next, I think. If I can get the money for it out of Noel Strawn. He smiled in curious wonder. What comes after the swimming pool? She stared out at the wet, miry expanse of earth that was the street. They'll get their hair wet in the swimming pool, so we'll have to have a beauty parlor, she said. I think that's the next thing. And after that, an open-air cinema. And after that, a battery of home laundries for the wet wash. And after that, a decent dress shop. She turned to him. Don't laugh, Joe. I know it sounds crackers, but just look at the results. I start an ice cream parlor and put Rose in it, and young Wakeling comes after her with a bulldozer. So you get your dams built. You're a bit ahead of the game, he said. They aren't built yet. They will be soon. He glanced round the ice cream parlor. If everything you want to do works out like this, he said slowly, You'll have a town as good as Alice Springs in no time. That's what I want to have, she said. A town like Alice. All that happened nearly three years ago. Jean married Joe Harmon in April after the mustering, as she had promised him. They were married by a travelling Church of England priest, one of the Bush brothers, who had been, oddly enough, a curate at St. John's in Kingston on Thames, not ten miles from where I used to live in Wimbledon. There was, of course, no church in Willstown at that time, although one is to be built next year. They were married in the Shire Hall, and all the countryside came to the wedding. They had their honeymoon, or part of it, on Green Island, and, I suppose, she took her sarong with her, although she didn't tell me that. It's winter now. There's nearly three months since I've been able to get out to the office or the club. My daughter-in-law, Eve, Martin's wife, has been organizing me. It was she who insisted that I should engage this nurse to sleep in the flat. They wanted me to go into some sort of nursing home, but I won't do that. I've spent the winter writing down this story. I suppose because an old man loves to dwell on the past. And this is my own form of the foible. And having finished it, it seems to me that I have been mixed up in things far greater than I realized at the time. It's no small matter to assist in the birth of a new city. And as I sit here looking out into the London mists, I sometimes wonder just what it is that Jean has done. If any of us realize, even yet, the importance of her achievement. When I thought of that, it seemed to me that I had done the right thing with the money, and that Mr. McFadden would have approved, although I had run contrary to the strict intentions of his will. I suppose it's because I have lived rather a restricted life myself that I have found so much enjoyment in remembering what I have learnt in these last years about brave people and strange scenes. I have sat here day after day this winter, sleeping a good deal in my chair, hardly knowing if I was in London or the Gulf country, dreaming of the blazing sunshine of black stockmen, cairns, and of green island, of a girl that I met forty years too late, and of her life in that small town that I shall never see, that holds so much of my affection.' 